and I had a six month time scale to sell my existing boat and buy a new one and be out of the UK. We'd been sailing at seven knots and we just stopped. Then I looked on the AIS and I could see that there was a Greek ferry coming towards us. <laughs> Wyland said the ocean stirs the heart, inspires the imagination, and brings eternal joy to the soul. Let's investigate that. Hello everyone, I'm Taylor Jane from Sailing Trinity. Welcome to a special five-part series that is serving as an intermission to our Around the Islands in 80 Days voyage. Unlike our usual stories of Greek mythology, in this series we dive instead into the modern tales of present-day sailors. We will explore their most memorable moments at sea, be it for better or for worse, the valuable lessons they've learned as a result of this lifestyle and their personal advice on living freely and fully. As I venture off on my personal travels this summer, I invite you to join us here every fortnight to dive deeper into a different colorful chapter of these extraordinary lives. Take a second now to subscribe and like the video before we jump in. Once again, I'm Taylor Jane and these are your storytellers for today. Testing, testing, one, two, three. The old classic. <laughs> <laughs> Better than uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, what did he say? He said, bomb Russia. Oh. Yeah, so my name is Jim Furness. I'm from the UK and I've been sailing about 13 years. Yeah, the first thing was when I started sailing, it was always because I wanted to go places. It was never actually about the actual kind of mechanics of sailing. It was the idea of having a boat and being independent. As soon as I got my first boat, almost the first thing I did was sail it from Scotland across the North Sea to Tiburon in northern Denmark. And there's a I think called the Limfjord, which is a seaway that goes right through the top of Denmark and takes you into the Baltic. So you can get into the Baltic without going up over the top of the, the Kattegat. And so I spent my first summer sailing around the Baltic and it's kind of the Mediterranean of the North. There are lots of beautiful little islands, amazing little harbors. It was just a fantastic place. And so I think after I'd spent two months sailing around there, I concluded that I could be quite happy living on the boat and also i was at a point where i was trying to figure out what to do next and one of the things i realized <laughs> was that for as long as i was living in the uk next to my business i would you know i would never actually stop working uh, you know so I, I realized that in order to do that and to do something different i had to physically get away yeah. that's it Beautiful. Yeah. thank mm -hmm. you for sharing So the boat's called Acheron, and I bought her new from Geno. So she was built in the United States because they have a production line there for this particular boat. And then they shipped it across the Atlantic, stuck it on a truck, and it was launched in the south of France. And I sailed her to, to Turkey. Why did I choose her? Well, I'd already had two boats previously, um, both 35 footers and at the point at which I worked out that I wanted to live aboard, I realized a 35 foot boat, even if I was on my own, is just too small. I needed a boat that wasn't too big so that I could handle it on my own quite easily. My plan was to find a second hand boat and I just happened to go on the Geno website one day, saw this at 44 DS, thought, yeah, that pretty much ticks all the boxes. I sent an inquiry off to Geno um just saying i'm interested in one of these boats would you take my boat in part exchange mm -hmm. um yes of course we are interested you know <laughs> so yeah, um i was living you know in scotland in dundee they said our our agent in scotland will be in touch with you shortly the price i was asking we said yeah i'll give you the, give you that against the new boat so i thought well you know what that's really just too easy it was nice because it was new i was able to specify you know, my electric winches, the upholstery I wanted, the cabin layout, everything. And I had a six-month time scale to sell my existing boat 
and buy a new one and be out of the UK. So it all just uh, fell into place. Yeah, the name. Yes. So therein lies the story. If you look to your left, you'll see a plaque on the wall and some photographs. My father was in the Royal Navy. He was a chief petty officer and he was a sonar operator on a submarine called HMS Acheron, which was basically a Second World War submarine. Mum -hmm. and dad, who were great drinkers and great socialisers, would go down to the boat two, three nights a week. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, this was in the 1960s. Yeah. So the role of mum and dad was not to entertain the kids. <laughs> um, and so we all just went. They sat in the petty officer's mess on the submarine, which was smaller than this saloon and would have about 20 people in it. <laughs> and I had the run of the boat, um, you know, and I was like nine years old. So you can imagine you're nine years old and you've got a Second World War submarine as your kind of playground. Maybe the captain walked past and he'd say, hello, Jimmy, you all right? You know, and then I would go down to the bow and the torpedo guys would, you know, and they were literally sleeping on top of the torpedoes. This made a very profound impression upon me. Um, and well, I subsequently, I didn't join the Navy. I joined the Air Force as it happened and became a, an electronics technician in the Air Force. But I always thought to myself, if I ever have a boat, I will call it Acheron. That's the, the reason for the name. So my father died when I was 25. Mm -hmm. So it's um, partly in memory of him. The secret gem oh, or hidden feature. Oh. <laughs> right, now for this you have to point the camera in this corner in this corner so yeah this and this is this is very very sad but this is my my most favorite hidden feature the water maker ah. <laughs> i love my water maker yeah so the the kind of hidden gym gem gym gem <laughs> gem it's the water maker and you might say well that's rather dull but you know if you want to live aboard and you want to cruise then part of that is being independent and if you don't have a water maker you often get driven into harbour when you don't particularly want to go uh, I'm, I'm not a kind of eco fanatic in any sense but i like the idea of you know living an environmentally friendly life and being also just being independent all right i'll put all this back <laughs> Yeah, so I counted it up. It's not that many. It's seven. And I set off from France, Italy, of course, all the way through the Greek islands, Turkey. I've been to sail to Israel, so we stopped in Cyprus on the way. Cyprus is actually a country all on its own. I, I used to think it was part of Greece, but it's I not. Until now. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you for it's not. It's a separate country. Okay. Yeah. So Israel and then uh, Montenegro. The country that surprised me the most is actually Turkey. Before I went there, I had no real concept of what it was like. I imagined this very arid, depressing kind of looking place full of big guys smoking hookers and stuff like that. Um, and of course, uh, the bit that I went to down in the southwest corner is just stunningly beautiful. It's green, it's mountainous, the water is just incredible colors. They, they call it the uh, the turquoise coast and it is the water is all these wonderful shades of deep green and blue. People are absolutely lovely. They can't do enough for you. So that really surprised me. And I remember quite early on, I was anchored somewhere up near Bodrum and we'd gone to the shore for a walk and walking along this dusty track. A couple came past on an ancient scooter he should have had his photo in National Geographic. You know, he had this wonderful kind of crinkly lined face, um, sort of pepper and salt hair and moustache and sort of cigarette just sort of hanging out the side of his mouth. And sitting on the back was his wife who was in a typical Turkish country dress, which is just very long, loose. And um, they had a pair of leather saddlebags on the back. And, and as they went past, I waved at them and said, Merhaba. And uh, they said, Mahaba, and then uh, they stopped. And the lady got off, opened the saddlebag and reached in and pulled out a huge bunch of grapes and handed them to me. And so I thought, oh, she wants to sell me some grapes. Mm -hmm. And so I went to get my wallet and she said, no, no. She said, no, 
It's a gift. When I got back to Kash, I spoke to one of my Turkish friends. I told them this story and they said, well, you're probably on their land because they were farmers. And he said that it's our tradition that somebody comes on your land that you welcome them and give them a gift. And I thought about this because, you know, they're on this battered old scooter. They're obviously, you know, living a fairly simple life. There am I with my very big, expensive, fancy yacht sitting in the bay and, and all this, that and the other. But they are the ones who are giving me a, a gift and that. And I came across that a lot in Turkey. Turkey, very, very interesting place. Yeah. And I think this is true of almost any country you visit. Whatever preconception you've got of that country, once you get there, you're going to find it, it's actually quite different or there are aspects of it that really surprise you. Yeah. Yes. So uh, a few years ago, I was right up north of Bodrum in Turkey. It was during lockdown. I'd been sailing up there. Turks are actually brilliant during lockdown because they took the attitude, it was quite pragmatic. Look, if you're on your boat, you're not really a problem to anyone. Go off, go sailing, enjoy yourself. Whereas, for instance, I had friends in Greece, they couldn't even leave the harbour. You know, they would just absolutely couldn't move. But yeah, it was very unfortunate, but we were very lucky in Turkey. When I went to set off, I discovered that my engine had chewed up the fan belt. It had chewed up a fan belt before and I just replaced it. And then it had done it again. So when it happens like that, you know, there's a problem. Probably the alternator was out of alignment. And so where you've got a fan belt, if one bit's out of alignment, then it's just going to destroy the fan belt. Yeah. There's nothing I could do about an alternator out of alignment. That needs a, like a proper marine diesel mechanic who knows what he's doing. He's got the right tools. Had to get the boat from there back to... Marmaris, well, I, I plotted the route, it's about 106 nautical miles, and I was doing it solo. I kind of planned a course to get me down there, and I, I wasn't going to do it in a one hour, I was going to spread it over three or four days. But the thing was that because of this issue with the fan belt, I used my spare fan belt already. Yeah, already. I had no span spare fan belts. I literally just had to run the engine long enough to get the anchor up. And then I had to sail. There wasn't a lot of wind. I was literally going along at two, two and a half knots, getting the code zero out. So I had to coax the boat all the way down the, the coast of Turkey. Bearing in mind, I'm also sailing solo, so it's quite tiring. And I think on the second day, I got a bit of wind. The boat's going great. And then I feel this sort of bump. I think, what the heck is that? I felt the wheel, the wheel's clear, Look, looked at the back of the boat, and up near the north of Quadrum, there's a lot of fish farms. And the way these fish farms are constructed, they're all made, made out of six inch diameter plastic tubing. And I had caught what must have been a 30 meter length of plastic tubing, and it had wrapped around the fin of the boat. So it was going 15 meters either side of the boat, and I was dragging this along with me. I couldn't get it off. So I thought, blimey, of all the things I've got to deal with, I now have to deal with this. Well, I couldn't get it off of the boat hook because it was just too heavy. Yeah. Eventually, it just floated off on its, on its own. I think that's a good example of how sailing just throws things at you. You can't anticipate them. You can read Yachting Monthly for the rest of your life, and you can do every course, and you can watch a million videos, but there will always be situations that occur for which you are just are not prepared at all, uh, and you just have to, to deal with it. On the fly. <laughs> On the fly, yeah. Yeah, I had to think about this. So I would say it's an adventure that never grows dull, and I think it's one that certainly fully engages me in body, mind, and soul. Uh, it's a wonderful combination of the practical, also really engages your intellect because you need to think about what you're doing and boats are complex bit of kit so there's a lot to understand for me it's a kind of deeply spiritual experience sailing because you know we've all got a really kind of a deep uh, yearning in us to 
to kind of go on some sort of voyage of discovery. And, you know, in sailing, it's literally a voyage of discovering, but, but it could be in many other walks of life, there could be many other ways of, of, you know, of doing it. And I think there's also the aspect that when you're out there sailing, that you're thinking, well, people have been doing this for thousands of years. And I always have the sense when I'm arriving at a new place, particularly, I love it when you get out to sea and you get beyond the horizon, you know, for a day or two, there's nothing, there's just sea. And then you see that little bit of kind of smudge of land on the horizon and it's whatever island you were heading to. And you feel as though you are discovering it for the first time, even though actually there's people living there and thousands of people have already been there, but you kind of have that feeling of, no, I'm discovering this place for the first time. And you are, for you, yeah, that's right. I'm sure there are other ways to get this combination of experience, but I haven't figured out what one of those other ways would be. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wouldn't say it was funny. I think it's probably more on the crazy end of the spectrum. So when I was sailing the boat from France to Turkey in 2018, we were doing a night passage across the Aegean. We were actually trying to get to Santorini. So it was three or four in the morning. My mate was up on watch. I was down in the aft cabin sleeping. I woke up thinking something's not right. And there was a bit of a kind of, there was a kind of funny creaking and groaning noise. And I looked at the Navionics on my phone. I could see we'd stopped. So I thought, that's odd. So I shot up onto the deck and I said to my mate, you know, what the, what the bloody hell's going on? And he said, I don't know, Jim. We're in about 100 meters of water offshore, 20 knots of wind on the beam. We had been sailing at seven knots and we just stopped. So we haven't run aground because there's 100 meters of water <laughs> under the keel. It was pitch black. Usually when you're sailing at night, there is some light, you know, moonlight, there's quite a bit of moonlight, but if there's no moonlight there is there is actually a bit of starlight it's not completely black but it was a cloudy night and there was no moon so it was literally pitch black we couldn't see a thing check the wheel the wheel is free so i thought well whatever we're snagged on we must be snagged on something it's not the rudder i thought what do we do because i could feel the whole boat is trying to move forward i thought well i don't start the engine because there might be something on the prop yeah. we don't know so then I looked on the AIS and I could see that there was a Greek ferry coming towards us. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, I thought, okay, the boat's trying to move forward, but it can't, we'll drop the sails. So we just dropped the sails. Then I just stood and looked at the GPS and we slowly started to move. And within about five minutes, we were moving at about three knots, just with the wind. So I thought, well, we must be free. Yeah. So we put the sails back up and off we went. After that, we said, right, we're just going to go to the nearest island with a decent bay we can anchor in, which is a place called Sykonos. So it had this great little bay. We sailed in there, crystal clear water, dropped the anchor. And my buddy, who was a bit of a diver, he went over the side and had a look. Nothing. I subsequently talked to someone about this and they said, there's a, an issue in that bit of the world with the Greeks putting up illegal fishing nets and they're supposed to be marked with boys, but there was nothing. And he said that, that quite often these nets are at about two, they're about underwater at about two meters and we draw 2.3 meters. So, you know, we were a bit like a, an F-18 landing on the deck of an aircraft carrier with its arrestor hook, you know, <laughs> catching the, catching the wire. Was it scary? I suppose possibly slightly a little bit scary. But, you know, I just kind of worked through it. Anyway, when we anchored in Sykonos and then I trudged up the, the hill and there was this lovely little Greek Orthodox church on the side of the hill and it was open. So I, um, I went in there and I did my, you know, did you ever watch Faulty Towers, Bez oh, Basil Faulty? I went back there and I said, <laughs> and I said, thank you, God. Thank you so much you know, <laughs> for getting us out of that one. Yeah. yeah. So we never did get to Santorini. Uh, I think that the the biggest fear I had was really, do I really deserve to be doing this? 
you know, is it okay for me just to go off and en enjoy myself and do, do this thing that seems very self-indulgent? And then going along with that was, well, I'd done some sailing before I bought the boat. Like many people, I never regarded myself as anything other than an amateur sailor who's kind of blundering along, figuring it out as he goes along. You know, certainly when I started sailing, I met a lot of kind of salty old sea dogs. You know, I got my first boats in Scotland, and so there'd be all these lovely guys that had all been sailing for 40 years, and they, they'd be said, I would I'd be saying, well, I think I want a boat with in mast furling. I said, oh, you didn't want a boat within the mast furling. The sail will get trapped in the mast. You should have a fully battened mainsail. And, you know, and they would go on like this. And I thought, well, these guys must know what they're talking about, you know. Of course, I discovered that actually they don't. Yeah. Well, well, they do. But the thing is that they're talking from 20 years ago when in mast furling was really terrible and the sails did get jammed in the mast quite regularly. So I had to overcome that. It's the basic thing. Although you know hardly anything, having confidence in yourself that you can actually make sound judgments and make the right decisions. And I discovered while I'm doing this, at one point I had somebody come on board just to, to help me sail because I was doing some overnight passages and I couldn't do them on my own. And, and you know, they were an ocean yacht master and they'd done this, that and the other. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, this is a very experienced person. And there were at least two or three occasions when we had to make a decision. I discovered that, in fact, my judgment was correct and their judgment wasn't. Um, and so that was another thing I thought, well, you know, oh, you're an ocean yacht master, but I've just got Dave Skipper, you know, what the hell do I know? So learning to overcome the fear of my own inadequacy, I think would be the, yeah, the big thing. Yeah. That's a sailing couple. Yeah. Uh, um, and Moni and Andreas, uh, they're primary school teachers in Berlin and they've got a year sabbatical. And they invited me on their boat the other night for goulash lovely. and uh, had a lovely chat with them and just such nice, wonderful people. And you meet people like that all the time when you're sailing. The other day, we did a bit of a road trip to Venezia with some friends on the way back um, in the marina car park. There was this guy with his RV and his BMW, which he um, put on a trailer behind it and I got chatting to him he was Greek German and he's driven his RV all over Europe and I had such a nice conversation with him and I mean you just look at him you know just look at his face <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I love that you know so the voyage of discovery isn't just places it's people you know yeah how, how long have you been photographing people in this format I started that quite recently. I mean, I've, I'm a bit of a photographer mm -hmm. anyway, and I've um, and what I've started to do is I've started to, I've started to keep a kind of journal. You know what it's like, you take lots of digital photos and then you have them on your phone. But what I've started to do is print them out and stick them in my journal. Um, and then um, I've kind of got a section here for people. And so when I meet, this is one of my friends in Dundee, but I like to print out the photo and then I like to write about each set of people. So I like all these people. Oh, that's, this is my, look, these are my granddaughters and their Jeep at Christmas. <laughs> um, and, ah, look, here we are. This is uh, Babis and I can't remember her name. He's the guy who owns a scooter shop who sold me his scooter. Oh, look, here's Hinton. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Hinton and his doggies. Yeah. yeah, and if we keep going, got to be in here somewhere. Uh, I wonder who it is. Ah, look. Ah, look who it is. <laughs> Would you believe it? The man himself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful, Jim. Thank you for sharing. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I would say, and I'm sure this is the advice that everyone gives, which is don't just dream. Actually make a plan and even if you can't do it in the, you know, in the very near future, make a plan and start taking steps towards it inch by inch. Go and do a sailing course, uh, sail on other people's boats, 
but make a plan and get there inch by inch. And the important thing is to go as soon as you can. So don't wait until you've got enough money to buy some wonderful dream boat. It's better to get on with it and have something that's a bit smaller and a bit older. You know, you can do it if you want to. And I, I get so many people who say to me, oh, I'd love to be able to do that. And you're so lucky and all the rest of it. And saying, well, you know, but not so much lucky. It just decided to decided to do it. Don't uh, allow people to tell you, oh, that's stupid and irresponsible. You know, you should be, you know, you shouldn't be buying a boat. You should be investing in a holiday property somewhere or you don't need permission from anyone else to do it. Yeah. So this is a poem by Marianne Williamson, Our Deepest Fear. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us most. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Or I could sum it up in my words, which is, if an idiot like me can do it, anyone can. You know, shop in Istanbul, and uh, I wanted new cushions for the boat, so I went in there and I found the cushions. And then I saw this jacket hanging on a rail. And um, so this is, it's, it's, uh, sorry, it's the wrong clothes to wear underneath. <laughs> I kind of want a nice pair of trousers and a nice shirt. But it's, it's made in Uzbekistan and it's silk and it's hand embroidered. I, I've worn, I wore it for my birthday actually with a nice pair of trousers and I've got a silk shirt with it. And I felt like I ought to be you know, in a Bollywood movie or, yeah. um, you know, I ought to be sitting cross-legged in a yurt, yeah. you know, discussing some number of camels that I'm going to trade yeah. for my third wife. Or yeah, yeah, like that, yeah. You know? it's, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's very snazzy. You give us a spin, yes. a twirl. Very nice. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> and, and wait for it. Oh, so very exciting. When I was in uh, Turkey. Yes. And so they said, we love the jacket, so, but I'm going to bring you a hat back from <gasps> Kazakhstan. So this is a... You have the entire regalia. <laughs> wow. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. It's, it's, it works together. I know. <laughs> you do. You are very some yeah. rural yeah, royalty. <laughs> well, folks, that's it for today's stories. Don't forget to head over to our channel to catch up on our 80 day voyage around the Greek islands while you're here. We're grateful that you took the chance to escape the ordinary with us today. See you in another video. Bye.